Hello, everybody. Hi, um, I'm Michael Bordo, and I'm, I would like to welcome all of you uh, to our conference. The conference is called a 50-year retrospective on the Shadow Open Market Committee and Monetary Policy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Shadow and then introduce John. So the Shadow Open Market Committee was founded in 1973 by Alan Meltzer, at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Carl Bruner, who was at Rochester, and Anna Schwartz of the NBR. And Anna, Anna, I worked with her for 40 years, so Anna was just a really special person, but the other two were too. And so what they did was they wanted to provide a, a constructive forum for improving monetary policy making. And they promoted the idea that the high inflation of the 70s was a monetary phenomenon and wasn't caused by the eclectic array of factors, which at the time was the con consensus view. And the, the shadow's minority vision, along with monetarism and Milton Friedman, won, eventually won the debate. And as monetary policy issues have evolved over the past half century, the shadow uh, and research by its members have continued to influence central bank policy making in the US and, and abroad. <clears throat> and the shadow has always emphasized sound money and the importance of a nominal anchor in the, in the conduct of monetary policy. It has highlighted the benefits of a rules-based monetary policy rather than a discretionary approach. It's highlighted the benefits of heightened central bank transparency. On fiscal policy, the SOMC has urged fiscal restraint and the importance of the Fed to steer clear of fiscal policy, credit policy, and its involvement through the balance sheet. And these stances align closely with the beliefs and research of scholars here at the Hoover Institution. So there's a, there's a complementarity between us. And the range of the shadows expertise has broadened as the Fed and global central banks have expanded their, their roles. And adding to the shadows legacy of monetary policy scholarship, shadow members include experts on in banking, bank regulation, financial stability, the Fed's expanded balance sheet, its role in international finance, monetary history, that's me, and government issues. And historically, several members of the, of the shadow have joined the Fed, and now the current shadow includes several former Fed, FOMC, Federal Reserve members. The current issues facing monetary policymakers are critically important to healthy economic performance as they were in the past. The shadow has played an important role as a watchdog on the Fed's policies in the past and promises to do so in the future. We thank the Hoover Institution and especially John Taylor and Marie Christine Slakey uh, for hosting and arranging this special conference. We also thank the Bradley Foundation and Smith Richardson Foundations for generous support. To highlight the evolution of monetary policy in the shadow in the last 50 years, and to address the key issues facing today's policymakers, the conference includes participation by SOMC members, by leading scholars of the Hoover Institution, and current and former members of the Federal Reserve and also foreign central bankers. Now, John Taylor's famous rule, which is an essential chapter in every central banker's guidebook, and his pioneering research on monetary policy rules have been at the heart of the SOMC's core beliefs for the past three decades. And so now, we have the privilege of having John Taylor tell us about rules versus discretion over the past 50 years. So I'll turn the, the uh, podium over to John and his slides. Thank you. I'm saying it's impressive to see all of you, especially this table in front of me. 
amazing experience for me. So I'm going to talk about this title, Rules versus Discretion, over the last 50 years. Where did it get 50 years? Well, that's how, how long the shadow has been operation. And it's 1973 is what I found out. It's prepared for this conference, which we have a title, the 50-year retrospective on the Shadow Open Market Committee and its role in monetary policy, and it, we're here in the Tritel building. So thank you, David and Joan, at the Stanford University place. So let me first mention uh, a few people who are behind the SOMC. Um, Alan Meltzer, of course, an old colleague. Where's Marilyn? Marilyn, thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Alan and I are long-term colleagues. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I've uh, admired Carnegie Mellon for so long. It's a great place, and uh, thank, thank you. And Carl Bruner was another member of the original group of three or four or five, however many you actually want to mention. And of course, Anna Schwartz is a very important part of the operation. I have to say, for me, maybe coming from Stanford where Milton Friedman had his office a few doors down from mine, I'm thinking of Milton too is part of the theory, part of the idea, part of what's going on in this whole thing. So the policy statement, which really goes back to Milton, and it emphasized a lot of monetary aggregates, that's for sure, more than I'm used to doing. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that. And let me say, if I might at the start, that I want to talk about policy rules, maybe too much, <laughs> maybe too much. I think it's very important that we, we don't forget about policy rules. We forget about them easily if we're not careful. So if you look at the second slide I have, it's table one from a paper I've recently written called the Federal, the Monetary Policy Rules are re as reported in the Fed's report. And you can see the Taylor Rule 1993, that's 25 years or so ago. And it's got the interest rate, you know, long-term, short-term, has the inflation rate pi, and it has the unemployment rate LR. And of course, there's various versions of this, if you see. So the Fed has been reporting on this in various ways, some of you responsible, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps not. But it's, it's really, for me, a way to communicate, to have a discussion of what really is going on with monetary policy. And I, I can't say enough that I appreciate the opportunity to speak about this topic, given that the FOMC has talked so much about it. Let me just, if you, know, you, you probably are bored by all the notation, which is part of the deal with Taylor Rule. First, it's just the Taylor Rule is the most important. But if you go to the second chart, <laughs> I'll tell you more about it. This is going back 50 years. This is a celebration we're having, 50 years. It's a federal funds rate, effective rate. And you can see the percent is on the vertical axis, years are on the horizontal axis, and it's called the, the effective federal funds rate. It goes back to the late 60s and 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, and there it is at the end. And so we've been seeing this for a long time. And this is the data. This is the, what the Fed reports. And you can see it got up to almost, almost 20%. Those are the bad old days. And what, what was going on when we were doing that? Let's not go back to that, whatever we do. But since then, and to some extent, it's because the Fed has followed a more rules-based system, I think that's part of the reason, it's gotten lower. And you can see it's gotten a little high recently off to the right. It's a little, little bit of a dip down, but it's still very high. And we, what the ideal is 3%, if you look at the 2%, if you look at the, in the measure I showed you a few minutes ago. So why it's been very high, it's, it's something that we should try to avoid. I'd like to see it like 2%, 2.5%, 4% in that range. And we don't know if it'll be in that range. It's, it's not just the Fed, it's other countries as well. So don't forget this chart. This goes back 50 years. And you can see we've had interest rates very high, very low, 
very, very low, very, very high. And we're sort of a medium state at this point, trying to get them down a little bit. And we'll see if we're, if we're successful at doing that. But that's really, in a sense, the goal, I think of the goal is to get the interest rate down to this rate. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have a rule. We have a series of rules. And one of the rules is listed here. So I've got the rule circled in red. It's called figure two. It's a, it's a so-called Taylor rule. A simple version of the Taylor rule is, is if inflation is two, P equals two, and the GB, GDP gap is zero, Y equals zero, then interest rate is four. So maybe it's a little bit high now, but basically it's where it should be. And that's coming, it doesn't really matter which version you use to say the same thing. But this is the so-called Taylor rule. And you can dispute, the, dispute this, argue about it as much as you want. But this is the thing that's attracted a lot of attention. And I'll, I'll say it's been very uh, gratifying to me it's attracted attention, but it's not the only reason. Other central banks have followed similar kinds of things as well. And so maybe we can talk about that. Mike said there might be some questions. I don't know if there's questions. But this is the first one is if the, just to remember the inflation rate is two, <laughs> P equals two, and the gap is zero, Y equals zero, the interest rate is four. So where is it now? Four. Now, let me just go to the next chart, which is more up to date. And it's indicating the interest rate decisions that the Fed has made. As it says, figure three, the Fed held the interest rate lower than the so-called Taylor rule, and the inflation rate rose sharply as the Fed then tightened policy. So this is, if you look at the, as I know it's hard to see, but the graph started to rise in 2016, and then it fell down in 2019, 20, 2000, and then it started to increase again. So that what I say is the mistake, if you like, was going down all the way to nearly zero, and then and, and reversing very quickly, coming back up again. And so this, this is the kind of thing you want to try to avoid. You want to signal as much as possible what you're doing. If the Fed really wanted to sing, signal that in advance, it could have, but it didn't. We don't know exactly why it didn't. It, it, it's, it, maybe I'll look at some of the people who <laughs> decided that. But that's the idea. And so the idea is you, as, as we as are, have already talked about, start to come down again, and we get to this 4% level. Now, the next chart is a little bit of history. It goes back to 20, January 2019. It's called figure four. This chart shows that the policy was too low. You can see it's too low, and this was the reason the inflation rose. And so you can just study this a few minutes. The policy rate is the dark blue line. The dashed line is the recommended policy based on generous Taylor rule. And the recommended policy is a less generous policy rule is the one that you can hardly, it looks, looks like a straight line. And you can see they're very low by any, mention, by any measure. And so that is the notion that I've focused on a lot in my discussion. I said, be careful what you're doing if you're not exactly right on. And so that's, that's the danger that you, you run into. And so I would say the, the ideal, we can debate this, the idea would be to keep the rate as close as possible to the, to the ideal rate at this point. And this is an example of that. You can see how far they off. They were off at the time. Now, finally, if you look at figure five, and then I'll try to wrap up as much as possible. This is figure five. This is the actual implicit price deflator. So this is the best measure we have of the inflation rate. And you can see how it got very high in the 50s and 70s and 80s and it came down to quite low, except for this recent period where it jumped to nearly 10%. And that's the, as again, the domestic price deflator. That's really what the Fed focuses on and looks on, at least one of the things they look at, look at, look at and talk about a lot. And so now it's started to come down. The question is, will it stay down? Will it stay at this 2% target, which is the Fed has been very explicit about 2%, uh, uh, about what, where they're trying to go. It's close to 2, 2.5, two 2.5, and, two and, and 3. And so really, that's the ideal. And you could see you want to avoid these spikes. The spikes are not, not the ideal situation that you have. If you go to figure 6, 
This is the unemployment rate as well. Yes, the unemployment rate. So the unemployment rate rose well above the target range, up to 15%, 15%. It came, it's come down quite a bit, so we don't think about that so much anymore. But you can see the rate really rose. This is from 2008 to the present, and you can see the, in, the unemployment rate rose quite a bit. And that's because of the Fed putting on the brakes and trying to do something about this high inflation rate, which they are trying to avoid. So uh, this, is the, this is the Fed completely. Now, one thing that's very important to keep in mind, and I'll spend a few minutes on this, is the Fed is only part of the global monetary system. There are other countries involved as well. There's ECB, there's the Bank of Japan, there's China. They're all over the place. And so the last chart I want to, you to focus on is the inflation rate in Latin America, our neighbor. Uh, it goes to January 22. It includes Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and Peru altogether, and the LA5. And you can see it's increased really at the same time as the Fed. And so this is the Fed is not unique in this respect. The Fed has really led the way. Uh, perhaps it's been a factor in all these countries. Now, these countries will come down, we hope, to 4% or 2% or wherever they want to be. And, and the idea is to find a global monetary system, and that's the goal, which is, which is similar to what the Fed. So the idea here, and I'll just conclude with this, the idea is, is we, as we try to reform our international monetary system, let's try to find a way that we have other countries, Russia, China, Japan, be part of the same system. Not exactly the same, but as part of the same system. And they can do that by having a rule or a strategy which is similar, maybe not exactly the same, but similar to the Fed. That means there's more discussion internationally. I spent a lot of time when I was in government working internationally, trying to figure out ways to have other countries be involved in this decision. But I think ultimately what we want to have is a situation where not just the Fed, not just the uh, Europe, not just China, not just Japan, but we have countries that are at the same method, same mechanism, and don't have this situation occurring again. So we're not there yet, and let me just conclude. We're not there yet. We're close, if you like. We're closer than we were two or three years ago. We were very far away. We're, we seem a little closer than we were, but we need to focus on this as a way to remedy the situation. And I think ideally, we'd like to have, this is the Fed's, so-called Fed's targets, 2% and for inflation, have the same 2% for globally, and have other countries be involved in that too. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Take a, a couple of questions and answers. Questions and then answers. Okay. Hi. Yeah, it's Ben Nelson. Thank you, John. Uh, Bill Nelson from the Bank Policy Institute. So to prepare for this event, I went back and read some of the original transcripts and research prepared for the the very first uh, S O. I find it hard to say S O M C, but <laughs> S O M C meetings, uh, and I was really struck by the disdain that they expressed for caring about interest rates when thinking about monetary policy, and the focus that they put on balance sheet uh, items, including money. Uh, and so I was just curious, but of course your, your rule is all about interest rates, interest rates that presumably are implemented um, through fine-tuning operations, very much sort of an antithetical to some of the things that they held dear. So I was hoping you could uh, sort of pull those two things together and explain the intellectual connection between uh, your, your work on rules-based asset policy and their original views about what was important and what wasn't important. So I've been interested in monetary policy rules all my life, starting before there was interest rate rules, where there are just money growth rules. So I have some experience with that, and say so my experience has driven me away from that. Not completely, but you know, if we go back to that, it's fine, but it's, it's so far it's driven me away from it. And I think in some sense, it's, it's easier to think about what the interest rate should be. Also, think about multi country This is a global situation. Think about Europe. Think about China. Think about Japan. If we have a way that 
2%, 3%, 4% is the rate that's discussed as the second part of your question more globally, then we'll be in better shape. I think that's, that's the way to think about it. Is there a way that we can have the global system more attuned to a 2% target globally? And maybe 2% is too high, maybe it's too low, but that that's, seems to be a rate which many people have agreed to, have thought about. And so let's stick with 2% and try to find a way that other countries can be part of that. Uh, yeah, Kevin Chen at uh, Horizon Financial. Uh, question, uh, you mentioned about Japan, right? So Japan has been in zero interest rate for so long, they tried to increase the rate, caused such a big turmoil this year. Uh, do you think it, you know, Taylor Rowe well, to be applied to, to Japan? What's the pro and cons? Let's say if we do it, increase to 3% three, three let's say. Well, the, 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 the Japanese, the Bank of Japan, I know most of them pretty well, look at the tail rule, they talk about the tail rule, it means they don't mean they follow it. They were too low, let's face it, they were too low for a while. Now they seem to be catching up. And so that's a good sign. That's a good, good uh, way it should be unfolding, it seems to me. Whether they'll go all the way or not, I don't know. It's not finished at this point. And they have big trading partners nearby, of China in particular, and Russia nearby, which you have to think about. But I think the, the notion, bear with me, the notion that the Fed leads the way, or is a leader in, the, in this method, makes quite a bit of difference. So I think that's how, why I would argue that the, the Fed is a key player in this debate. Yes, in 2012, through uh the uh, pandemic recession, M2 and nominal GDP were about two to three percent. Then the Federal Reserve increased the money supply by 35 percent. According to monetarist doctrine, a year later, inflation took off. Powell has said that he doesn't pay attention to money anymore. Is this a mistake on Powell's part? And do you think that money is what was a major cause of the inflation? I don't think it was the major cause. I, I showed you charts which indicate that the rate was too low, the interest rate was too low. I'm not saying that money is not important. Money is very important. I worked on money more than half of my life. And so I think it's, it's an important aspect, but it's not the only aspect. And I think to some extent it's easier internationally. It's easier to think about other countries with having the same kind of interest rate as the US, maybe not exactly the same, different circumstances in other countries, that will be better off. And so that's, that's the ideal I have, is you have a system whereby not just the United States, but this is a global situation, other countries do the same kind of thing. So that's, that's my, my short answer to your very difficult question. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, particularly in the last chart, there were actually several central banks uh, that raised rates before the Fed, particularly in emerging markets like Brazil and Czechia, and yet they seem to have had similar, if not worse, inflation outcomes in the United States. I'm just wondering if you could kind of walk through why you think that might have happened. Thank you. So uh, different central banks are different. There's different mechanisms, different ways prices and wages are set. So that's probably the reason why you're seeing not exactly the same. It looks like exactly the same. In fact, if you look around the world, some are in good shape, some are in bad shape. And so I think that's, that's why monetary policy is so difficult. You have to have some sense of what's going on individually in each country. And that's what I would argue for is looking at these Latin American countries as well. It's not just Latin America, it's just to give an example where the rate has increased substantially uh, inflation rate has increased substantially during this period of time, and it gives you a sense of what to look for. That's it. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That was great. Really great.